Um, I'm not going to have any slides because I just really wanted to interact with the room and, and, and focus on that rather than, than focusing on the slides. So um, uh, I've been tasked with talking about what are the current trends in neuromodulation for pain. And so just to, to put that into a little bit of perspective, I guess we have to say, where did we come from, where are we now, and where are we going to end up in, in say, 10 years' time? I think with the current rate of change of technology expanding beyond 10 years might be uh, uh, making more of a prediction capacity than, than we actually can do. I would not have predicted we'd be where we were now in this field that I work in uh, 15 years ago. So that, that shows an example of that. So, as Nick said, the first spinal cord stimulator went in in 1967, uh, the year of my birth, and uh, really for about 40 years, we've had a period where we've had a fairly narrow focus on refinement and reliability and working out who this is for. So there have been three main themes in terms of what happened in that first 40 years. And it is kind of an example of the slow exponential process of things taking off that it took 40 years to sort of get to where we are today. In that 40 years, we kind of added little contacts on those leads that Nick showed you. So we started with two, and then we went to four, then we went to eight, and just to keep going on the same thing, we went to 16, and then we went to 32. And we sort of got the battery and tried to make it a little bit smaller and a little bit smaller and a little bit smaller. So there was that kind of iterative process that took up a number of years. Maybe it was a little bit uh, um, narrow-minded, perhaps, what could be achieved. And then the second band of trying to work out the process uh, of, of these stimulators was really the concept of finding out, okay, who does this work for? And in addition to that, how do we select the right patient? So we wanted to work out, well, what type of pain does it treat? And when you start a field from scratch, you have no idea. And you simply put it in anyone who seems to have a very refractory resistant pain condition, and you observe the response. So the pioneers in our field literally approach this via trial and error, and then reporting at conferences like, like this, for example, their experiences. So a lot of the early reports was somebody standing up as a neurosurgeon and saying, I have done 100, this is where it worked, this is where it failed, and somebody else did that, and then they went, oh, well, that's happened to him as well. And slowly but surely, we grew up with some various ground rules. Now those ground rules revolved around saying, if you have nerve pain, then this looks like it's something that can work to control nerve pain. If you have chronic hip pain, as, as Dennis did, for example, if you have the knee pain that's coming from two bones rubbing on each other from a lack of cartilage rather than nerve pain, if you have a chronic ankle arthritis, it is really not going to necessarily reduce the pain as much. So we began to focus on treating this concept of nerve pain or neuropathic pain. In addition, we also found through just trial and error experience, and this one took a long time, this one took close to 20 years to work out, that if the person is really, really distressed, if they're in not only a world of hurt, but a world of emotional distress on the inside, if their capacity to cope with moment to moment, their capacity to engage with things around them doesn't exist at that point in time, it doesn't mean forever, but at that point in time, then you drop one of these in and ask them to take it and run with it, they don't have the capacity to do so. They don't seem to have the same response as somebody who has had time to think about it, time to commit to it, time to have coping skills on board to then take this and translate the pain reduction into functional improvement, into regaining things in their life. And so we realise over this 20 year period that we have to deliver the right therapy, that's therapy for neuropathic pain, to the right person. That is, they either have to be ready to roll with these emotional stability and life skills and control over anxiety and control over depression, or we have to put in a program to help them with their anxiety and their depression and give them a chance to then have access to this therapy later. I have sometimes worked with somebody who I knew needed a stimulator, but it took me five years to get them to the point where I knew it would work for them. 
And you just would keep working. You keep working and working with that person because it's only five years of their life and they might have another 20 years to go. So you just make that commitment to help get them to where they go. And they can see maybe no light at the end of the tunnel, but you need to work with them and, and go on a journey with them. That's part of what we're doing in pain clinics. So the third part was really producing guidelines for doctors because it's all well and good to have you know, one person who does 100 a year of these and has 20 years experience. But what about the person who does 10 a year or five a year? They're not going to have the same experience. And they need to leverage off the experience of somebody who has a major commitment to this field. So uh, part of it was growing the society, part of it was the society producing guidelines. Professor Levy has been in the forefront of the development of these guidelines uh, for our colleagues. And that has allowed us to get to kind of where we are today, if you like. And the issues today that we're facing, we say, well, where are we now? The issues today are related to public knowledge about this therapy, which is really lacking, and access to the therapy. Let, let me just crunch some numbers for you, if I may. We know that about 20% of the Australian population has some form of, of pain. But for that, it might be intermittent pain, it might be mild pain, but we know probably around about 10% of patients have got severe pain, and we know about half of those, we know about 5% of the Australian population has got severe, unrelenting pain that affects their activities of daily living on a daily basis. Okay, so if we think about 5%, okay, that's about um, 1.25 million people. Now, not, not all of them need neuromodulation. They might need assessment in pain clinics. Um, so we can probably say, well, maybe 10%, 20% of those might need neuromodulation. 80 to 90 percent will be able to manage with simpler, simpler techniques. So then we get down to a situation where we've probably got about uh, 250,000 people at, at, a, at a minimum that are suitable for this therapy because they have chronic mm -hmm. unrelenting pain, it's affecting their daily life, and all therapy in the pain clinic has, has, has not responded for 250,000. And how many stimulators go in a year? 2,500. So that means one in a hundred people who actually need this treatment actually get access to it. And so whilst it's all good for us as doctors to, uh, you know, I'll, I'll be facetious, navel gaze at a conference on how we can go from 70% pain relief to 73% pain relief, and that's good, and we want to keep going and going. That's not really the issue when it comes to Australian society and, 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 and as we know, uh, society around the world. It's about how do we raise information amongst the general public, how do we raise information uh, amongst um, the general practitioners, for example, and how do we get this regarded as a um, uh, acceptable, commonplace therapy that has a place in our public hospitals, in our private hospitals, and supported by government. And at this stage, I would say we are not winning that process. So, for example, we've moved, as, as, as you may know, we've moved in uh, 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 private health fund to a system of gold, silver, and bronze. So most of us, if we have private insurance, will be slotted into one of those categories. And we've got a series of insurers that are going to cover these devices at the basic level of bronze, some that are going to cover it in silver, and a big negative shout out to the Booper and Medibank Private, because then unless you have gold coverage, you are no longer going to be covered for these devices. So that's not good. That's disenfranchisement of, of patients. And it's not as if the alternative is, oh, we'll just put up with your pain. What will happen is a number of people will go on to have their fourth or fifth spine surgery because they can't get access. And the chance of success from number four and number five is, is, is you know, remote to zero. So that doesn't help those individuals. So I think we've got a job to do to communicate to people, this is no longer therapy that's really at the end of the line. This is no longer a therapy that needs to be just maintained in these tiny little pain clinics with these doctors doing these weird things. We need to understand, and as Nick has said, we've done economic modeling from Deloitte Economics. It only takes 24 months for the Australian government to make its money back on the device of 25,000. Because after a successful one goes in, 
There is a lack of more x-rays being done. There is a lack of people turning up to their GP. People come off various medications and no longer are getting scripts. And a number of people who've got a capacity to do so return to work. And if you look at the indirect things in terms of somebody actually becoming a functional grandparent again and being able to care for children, which allows them their daughter to go back to work, Okay, there, there, are, there are many ways through which this saves money in our system. And at the moment, we're having a little bit of difficulty with our government to promote that. And I think the patient story, just as Dennis's story, is a very powerful story. Patient story, when you write your story and you send that to your member of parliament, that is worth five hours of me arguing with the Minister for Health. <laughs> it makes so much more difference. Um, so I would encourage people to consider adopting an, an active approach to that. So to put, to put things into perspective, you know, when we talk about um, what do opioid medications do for reducing pain, they probably reduce pain. If you think about the pain scale, all there's no pain, tennis, the worst pain you can imagine, you know, what number is your pain? You know, opioids probably reduce it by about 0.5. So that's really not much. If we look at combining treatments, so we look at um, cognitive behavioural therapy, cognitive behavioural therapy and psychology and pain management programs are very, very good for giving people back the capacity to do things. And that's important, and I don't want to um, downplay that. It's an integral part of what we use in pain clinics, even people who have stimulators. But their ability to reduce pain on a pain scale, again, is limited. It's probably around 0.5 to, to 1 to 1.5. So drugs are not necessarily the answer for our patients. What we're getting from stimulators, for example, for pain, is reductions in pain of 5. So if you start with a pain score of 9, on average, 100 people have one in, would average their pain as being 4. If you start with 6, you end up with 1. So you can see that that is almost an order of magnitude, like 10 times, 10 times more, than what you can get from a opioid painkiller. Um, and when you combine this with psychological therapy, that's when we get the absolute wins of using both therapies together, one to reduce pain and one to improve function. In terms of the trends to where we're going to from now, there's multiple trends. There's trends in terms of the devices that are becoming smaller, the battery shrinking, we're having the ability to have a battery external to the body and communicate via different systems internally. Um, and we're uh, expanding the types of leads and so forth and the waveforms that are used. So in prior times, we might say, pick a company, and the company has a proprietary waveform that the device uses, and that treats 70% of people, but then 30% get lesser results. Now what we're seeing is, okay, what we really want is we want four waveforms in the device. And 70% will be a winner with one waveform. We we'll take the next group of 30% people, we we'll try the second waveform in the device. We we'll get 20% of them responding. The third waveform treats 5%. The fourth waveform treats 5%. That way, we're being able to not be so worried about what type of stimulator we put in. We've got a whole bunch of waveforms there. So there's a convergence towards this concept that to a certain degree, each company will steal each other's waveforms and put it all in the one device. And that is a good thing for patients. But in addition to that, where neuromodulation is moving is really in uh, uh, not just pain reduction, but as Rob was saying, is restoration of function. So we're seeing the use of neuromodulation in Parkinson's disease to normalize the gait so that people can walk normally instead of having that shuffling, frozen, Concerning the gait, actually, it allows people to walk normally, and that's just with the spinal stimulator in, in the epidural space of the spine. We're looking at different ways that we can improve people who've got um, uh, back pain early in their life. If you've got back pain in your 20s or 30s, it's often because the muscles, the deep supporting muscles of the spine, they're called the multifidus muscles, they are no longer working properly the way they were designed to do. Now, we may not want to necessarily block nerves because there's no neuropathic pain at that time, it's a muscular dysfunction problem. But if we can stimulate the nerve to that muscle, we can get that muscle working. So we can give the muscle a workout in the morning for half an hour, a workout in the evening for half an hour, and the other 23 hours a day that device is turned off, but yet the back pain can resolve. So that's a great way to actually functionally restore the problem. And we will find out over time whether by doing that we prevent degeneration of the spine 
which may or may not occur, we don't know at this point in time. So these are different ways that we can change things. And as Nick said, when he's talking about the early things, we're looking at some of the sort of inflammatory um, diseases of modern life, if you like, and looking at, okay, how can we create an anti-inflammatory world for people to improve their quality of life? One way is to eat a healthy diet, eat plenty of different coloured fruit and vegetables. That's going to give you an anti-inflammatory um, uh, benefit. You can exercise, you can keep your weight down. But some people will have, through genetics or, or whatever, a system of inflammation in their body. They'll have rheumatoid arthritis, they'll have lupus, they'll have other inflammatory conditions. How do we switch off these inflammatory conditions? And people are looking at ways that we can try and do that. And if we can do that, we'll be able to alter things. There is a future that's a bit unwritten, if you like, which is looking at how do we expand, expand life, lifespan. We know that one of the greatest predictors of expanding lifespan is whether your heart rate, things on your pulse and your heart rate, whether that wanders up and down as you breathe in and out. So as you breathe in and out, it should change the rate a little bit that your heart is actually beating at. Now, if that is varying up and down, that's a good healthy system, and that is related to long lifespan. And if your system doesn't move then up and down, then you are destined to have a shorter lifespan. And there are ways that we're looking at how can we change this thing called heart rate variability. So we are expanding away from just pain control. We're trying to look at also these areas of restoration. To try and give you a convergence concept, when we started in, in pain medicine in the 1970s with the stimulators, 30% of people were getting 30% pain relief. I mean, it's a wonder those pioneers didn't give up because it was hard yakka with devices that were not so robust and broke down and needed to be fixed. But they saw enough value to, to keep going for these people. We got to, in the 2000s, um, uh, um, what's called the 50-50 club. So 50% 50 of people were getting 50% pain relief. And now we're up to the latest devices, including a device that was developed here in Australia that's a feedback system, for example, where we can see 80% of people getting 50% relief and and 50% um, uh, of people getting up to 80% relief. And we will probably converge using the 80-20 rule. We will probably converge at some future point in time, about five years from now, 80% of people getting 80% pain relief. And that's probably as good as we can ever expect it to be. But by improving function, we should be able to then really change people's lives. Mm. I think we're in a golden age now of technological device and technological understanding of our, of our neuromodulation systems. What we then have to break through is break through the issues related to the constraints on the healthcare system, where this device is mostly unavailable uh, to many care patients <coughs> in a public hospital. We've only got about four centres in Australia in, in a public hospital that will implant patients. So it, it is really unfair to have a two-tiered system. So we have to marry what's a golden age in technology, we have to marry that to uh, a future golden age in acceptance <coughs> and availability. And you guys are part of that answer. Thank you.